The city is split into three islands, each with their own personality. They also each are home to one of the game's three acts. The Neon District is the most well-off and vibrant island. It's named after its many neon signs and blooming business. The first act, which sets up the story, takes place here. The Warren is the opposite, a gross, rundown area of town full of poverty. It's also the largest district, implying that a lot of people in the city are not doing well financially. The prison and the largest hospital are located here. People here have a hard life, and thus it's the perfect place for the second act where everything in Cole's situation is challenged and changes. The historic district is the oldest part of town and has an art deco style to its architecture. It's smaller than the other islands, which gives it some character of existing before the city was as big. The first suns are based in this district, and this may have been the most developed area of the city when Kessler took control of them decades ago. It's symbolic of the history Cole will learn in the third act. Infamous is excellent at setting up, paying off, and leaving mysteries open. Many little questions and hints constantly come up. Some are obvious and some are barely noticeable. Sounds like a bunch of garbage. But one of the things that we really find fun about superhero stories is the process of understanding where these powers came from and why they're there. In Infamous, this isn't a question that gets answered all for you at the beginning of the game. At first, it's just the standard uh, disaster film where you uh, happen to have superpowers. And as you get more into it, you understand that everything is not as it seems, and that the people you know aren't necessarily who you think they are. It's like peeling an onion. You figure out one thing, you think you understand it, and then you find out that, well, you kind of understood it, but there's something deeper going on. The main mystery is about Kessler and the Blast, but the side mysteries of Moya, John, Sasha, and Alden are interwoven into the main one, which creates a world with a lot of depth. The pacing of how often you get questions and answers is perfect. The game starts with Cole waking up in a fiery crater with superpowers. Automatically, there are many questions, and they won't all be answered until the end of the game. It is explained that Cole was a courier, and the explosion was caused by him opening a package he was delivering. Then we learn that the package contained a device called the Race Sphere, which was made by a secret organization called the First Sons, and it used the blast to absorb the energy of the people it killed and put it into Cole to give him powers. The Race Sphere has gone missing, and Moya's husband John was sent to go after it, but now he is missing too. Cole and Moya find messages from John, and Zeke suspects that Moya shouldn't be trusted, but Cole doesn't take him too seriously. They talk about how Cole's boss said he was the only one who could deliver the package, and that Cole was called by someone and told to open it. The Reapers cough up black tar, which is also showing up in the water system. A strange man named Kessler shows up and gives Cole a vague vision of the future. It's revealed that a conduit named Sasha can produce a mind control toxin, which is the black tar, that she uses to control people she captures and turns them into Reapers. The First Sons show up and capture Sasha to prevent her from telling Cole their secrets. Kessler reveals that he is holding her prisoner and taunts Cole about self-sacrifice. Moya reveals that the military is ready to bomb the islands at a moment's notice if things get out of control. The First Sons don't know where the sphere is either and are using drones to search for it. Alden is introduced as the leader of the Dustmen through dialogue, although we know nothing about him. Then we learn Alden's backstory which answers who he is, but brings up more questions about Kessler, who is the leader of the First Sons. Alden is captured but escapes when Zeke is more interested in being a hero than keeping guard. John reaches out to Cole and says that he has found the sphere and that Moya isn't his wife. The sphere is in Alden's possession and it is lost when Zeke betrays Cole for powers that Kessler promises him. Cole goes after Kessler and Kessler kills Trish. Cole and John learn that Kessler is using Sasha for her mind control toxin. Moya asks Cole to give her the sphere once he gets it and Cole knows that's all she ever wanted. Cole and John track down the sphere again, and John dies when it breaks open upon Cole trying to use or destroy it. Cole goes to face Kessler and learns the ultimate truth of his plan, that Kessler is him from the future who failed to save the world and went back in time to prepare Cole. The pacing of the gameplay is also perfect. After a really intense mission, the game gives you some that are slower and less demanding. You just casually shoot some bad guys, get a new power, or investigate a new lead. But for the most part, each story mission has a fight that's harder than the last one. 
You can never really catch a break and don't get bored because you're always being challenged. The game never lets you feel too powerful, except for when it's appropriate in the story. As you become more powerful, you feel able to take on more and more difficult enemies, but not able to overpower everything in the game. Power for the whole city is shut down after the intro missions, and Cole must bring it back to the city section by section. This makes the open world expand as the story progresses, and you feel like you are slowly becoming more powerful. The powered down areas have more enemies and very few drainable objects. They are extremely difficult to play in, and it's best to wait until you've powered them up to explore them unless you want a challenge. This locks off content so it can't all be experienced at once, and it's not overwhelming. Every time Cole restores power to a section of the city, he also gets a new power himself. All the new powers are useful, fun, and add variety to how you can approach a fight. Each power fulfills a need and an anti-ability before. I wish I could travel faster. Well, now you can with the power of the induction grind! <sighs> I wish I could shoot farther. Well, now you can with the power of precision shooting! I wish I could jump farther. Well, now you can with the power of static thrusters! I wish I could defeat turrets easier. Now you can with the polarity wall! I wish I could rain down death and destruction from above to completely obliterate all who stand before me. Um, I think you might be asking for too much now, bud. Oh. Ah, oh, fuck it. Well, now you can! By harnessing electricity, you could bring the city back to life. And then, if we did that, then you could suddenly go into areas of town where there wasn't electricity and it would be much more difficult. And it didn't feel like we'd invented that. It felt like a very natural progression. And so it didn't feel like a game. It felt like an experience. And you know, it's a combination of gameplay, narrative, and technology that all have to come together to make that work and electricity was the, the fixed point that really helped us get there. You get new powers and turn on power to the city by going into the sewers and re-establishing the circuit for that area. These linear sewer missions are exceptionally designed tutorials for the new powers. Each one is tailored to give you practice with a specific power you just unlocked. You have to slow down time with precision to charge these electrical boxes. Don't know the right angle to lob grenades at yet? If you aim at these green lights, you'll hit your target. I don't like that the new powers are spoiled in these cutscenes. It's a minor nitpick, but I think it would have been much cooler to see what the power is for the first time just by using it. Getting new powers and opening up new areas of Vampire City is perfectly paced so that you feel like you get new content a lot, but have enough time to digest the old stuff. You start by only being able to look, walk, and jump, and get so much more. The power being shut down is symbolic of Cole losing power in his life, as he is now Moya's slave. Throughout the game, he works to slowly regain control, and the gameplay reflects this. It also really works with the hero story, because it's like he's bringing life back to a dead city. The first new power you get are touch abilities, which let you choose how to deal with downed enemies and pedestrians. This is a great way to have many karma choices throughout regular gameplay. You can drain someone of their bioelectricity which kills them, but will fill your health and energy. This is super useful in combat and tempting to use out of selfishness. The other option is to capture enemies which defeats them while keeping them alive. The selfless choice that gives Cole some Batman morals. You can also heal the injured pedestrians to gain good karma. You're encouraged to take your time to clean up after a fight to get the most out of it, but you can completely skip that and not lose much at all. In this mission, one of Moya's contacts you've been looking for is blocking a doorway you need to get through. He's doing it until he knows his wife is safe, but Cole had found her dead body earlier. You choose to either tell him or just shoot him to let you through. It's almost an interesting moral dilemma, but ultimately is just kinda cheesy. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! The next new power is electric grenades. They are what they sound like. They're explosives that do splash damage and when thrown will fall with an arc. They're really useful for dealing damage to groups of enemies. When you upgrade them on good, enemies will be knocked down for longer periods of time and with the last upgrade, be automatically captured. Your grenade separates into more and more grenades each time you upgrade it with evil karma. Trish is making Cole help her because she thinks he owes her, and Cole can't say no because he loves her. 
This is fantastic character conflict. Trish still loves Cole and wants him close, but is also putting all her anger on him. So she gets both done by using him to do tasks that she can't do. Sasha is introduced through hallucinations Cole has after getting the black tar on him. She's a conduit who's a former member of the First Sons, but was kicked out after a romantic relationship with Kessler went wrong. Her mind control powers were activated in the blast, and afterwards she started snatching people off the streets and controlling them with her toxin to take over the Neon District. She's now poisoning the water system with her tar to try to gain even more power. Much like she contaminates the people's drinking water, she and her Reaper gang are a contaminant to society. Wait. Why are people drinking from a public fountain? Sasha is a sexualized female character, but it has a purpose that serves the story. Her seduction fits right in with her lust for power and ability to mind control people. She tempts Cole towards the evil side of karma and has a role as an optional love interest. She urges him to not take on the responsibility he doesn't want and says that no one cares for him. You're all you know. No one cares about you. The girl. Not the fat man on the roof. Which, to a degree, ends up actually being true by the end of the game. I've always loved you, Cole. Always. Forever. Yes, I love technology. But not as much as you, you see. But I still love technology. Always and forever. Hey, Cole! How about you walk around to the other side of the valve and turn it from behind? Then you wouldn't get sprayed in the face with- NO! You're being a jackass! Anyways, this is another good choice that puts selfishness into gameplay. You either get tar in the face again, which blocks out a portion of your energy bar, or maybe I force this guy to do it for me. Time for another new power. At the start of the game, you get new powers quickly to get the main elements of gameplay set up. Cole's movement is slow while you're still learning the basics of the gameplay and the story, but is significantly sped up as the game goes on. This power, the induction grind, adds a lot of speed to your movement. Cole slides along electric wires as if he were riding a skateboard on them. This is an amazing power. Not only does it make you faster, but it fits perfectly with the city and is a super cool idea. To me, it's one of the most iconic things in the game. This power also incentivizes the player to climb more because it's now faster to travel on rooftops than on the ground. Cole and Moya are really reaching for answers. Their search for John and the race fear is sort of hopeless right now. The Reapers are holding a train full of people hostage, and she has Cole help to look for John, which is a great reason for Cole to still help the people, even when evil. Moya is leading Cole into more and more dangerous situations and clearly cares very little for his well-being. This is a really good vehicle mission, by the way. Not all of them are. Yeah, well, I think I'd rather have gotten sprayed in the face again. At least that didn't keep me from absorbing electricity. What? Yes, it did. We are introduced to our main antagonist, Kessler, pretty late in the game, about a fourth of the way through. Infamous sets up its gameplay, characters, and mystery before getting to the heart of the conflict. This has the effect of creating more mystery in the start of the game and makes you feel like you are solving more and more of it as you get deeper into the story. It makes the villain reveal more impactful. By the way, almost every time this mission ends, the train goes by, giving you a fast way back to Zeke's roof. That's just excellent game design. No protection? Pre-order Infamous Second Son now to get free condoms! No, I'm serious. That was a real thing in Italy. The next new power is Precision. It allows Cole to slow down time and zoom in while aiming at the cost of using the energy bar. This is a sniper power and it's very useful. It fulfills the need for range, accuracy, and taking enemies out faster. Back with Trish, she's having you defend a crate of medical supplies, which gives you a tough fight and ultimately feels like it leads nowhere. Kinda like Cole's relationship with Trish. He's trying, but can't convince her of the truth because she's unwilling to believe him. He's defending a seemingly hopeless relationship. This mission puts you in Cole's shoes with how he feels about Trish, and it's even literally unfair because you can't shoot through this fence and the Reapers can. Zeke isn't helpful at all here. He's distracting and doesn't seem to care for Cole's real issues. I'm thinking we call it the Crippler. You know, cause no one's coming back from that one. We can 
plaster it all over some t-shirts, make some serious cashola. Think about it, man. You're the muscle, I'm the brains. Moya finds where Sasha is hiding, in an underwater tunnel, and Cole goes to take her down for a first act finale. You fight every type of reaper enemy, and then Sasha herself. As you descend into her evil lair, you'll discover the truth of who the Reapers really are. Just normal people taken off the streets, not drug dealers and criminals after all. This adds some moral complexity because you've been killing these people without knowing they were innocent. This isn't reflected in gameplay at all though. Sasha is a great boss fight. She is only open to attack while she's attacking you. You have a limited amount of time to hit her, and during that time, you also have to dodge her attack and stay out of the tar on the ground. Sasha is attractive and creepy at the same time, which represents how power can be desirable, but corrupting. You'll never control it, Cole. Look at me. Look at what it's done. It controls you. She used her powers for selfish reasons, and it left her empty and insane. She foreshadows what Cole could become if he is selfish and evil. During the fight, Sasha will confuse Cole with Kessler, which is a fantastic detail and hint towards the ending, but one that'll probably go right over your head. Kessler, why do you love her? Kill her! I swear it! I'll wear her skin like a robe! Cole defeats Sasha, but before he can get any answers out of her, the First Sons capture her. Cole comes out of the tunnel and onto a new island, the Warren, which are the slums of Empire City. You are immediately being attacked by new enemies, the area is powered down, the mission start isn't very close, and you're all alone. You feel vulnerable and disoriented. You'd expect a bit of a break after beating a boss, but the game isn't kind enough to do that. This gives you a taste of what's to come in the second act. The first act set everything up. The characters, mystery, and gameplay which you now have the hang of. The second act will challenge all these things. So you go turn on the power and get the static thrusters ability. We were flying, but we never get this is one of my favorite powers in the game. It allows you to glide while in the air and reach longer distances with your jump. It consumes no energy, so it can be used as much as you want. Grinding on wires sped up traversal, and this does too by making it more efficient. You spend less time falling like an idiot, and gliding around is really, really fun. In the Warren, there's a new group of enemies, the Dustmen. They were homeless people before the blast, the weakest members of society. But now they've been united by a leader and given the opportunity to take what they never had, power. They reflect Cole as they were once powerless and unimportant, but are now strong. The Dustmen use their power for vengeance on a world they failed in and were forgotten by, picking people off the streets to use them as slave labor for building their giant tower. They are led by Alden, an old conduit who was going to be the next leader of the First Sons before Kessler came and took over, casting him out on the streets. Because of his troubled life and desire for what he lost, he's gone crazy. He still feels like he is entitled to the power that Kessler took from him, and sees the blast as an opportunity to get revenge and his birthright back. Alden is a villain, but you kind of feel bad for him. When it comes to the Dustmen enemies, many of them are the same designs as the Reapers, except with more health. The Gunman, Shield Guy, Shotgun Dude, RPG Bro, Mini Gun Mate, and the Suicide Bomber. Wait, why the fuck would the Dustmen have Suicide Bombers? Think about it. It makes sense for the Reapers because they were mind controlled, but the Dustmen have control over their own minds and value the power they now have. They wouldn't want to blow themselves up. Maybe Sucker Punch should have put some thought into this before they made a TERRIBLE GODDAMN GAME! So, the new Dustman enemies are... Crabs. Or are they spiders? Or scorpions? Anyways, they're arachnids made of trash held together by Alden's telekinesis power. These enemies are weak but powerful in numbers, which perfectly represents the Dustman. They die in one hit but are fast and can stun you. The best way to take them out is to hit them all with a blast, or just avoid them by climbing out of their reach. They force you to think fast. The Dustman also have a conduit. He has a lot of health, can launch spiders, and has an RPG. So how did all the Dustman conduits get Alden's power? Is it some sort of First Son's mentalism that he taught them? How do they not suffocate with trash bags on their heads? Like, are there holes where their eyes and mouth are, or is that paint? 
Am I looking into this too much? The final new dustman enemy is the golem, a giant body of junk controlled by a dustman. This is sorta like a reappearing boss enemy. It has a lot of health, which is indicated by the color it glows, another great use of graphics. It fires a junk machine gun at you, junk grenades, and if you get too close, it will try to stomp on you. To avoid the grenades, you have to keep moving, and to avoid the rapid fire, you either have to take cover or be really good at dodging. The enemy's weakness is its large hitbox, which you can continually fire at during most of the fight. You have to remember to play it safe while being patient and not be too risky to take them down. But to deal more damage to it, you can shoot its arm off while it uses rapid fire. This is a great element that adds depth to these fights and a bit of risk and reward. After turning on the power, you have two new missions to complete, and which one you do first is up to you. Zeke wants you to track down a guy named Dwight so he can get a date with his sister. Didn't that guy steal your car and strip it down for parts? Yeah! Yeah! And Trish wants you to work with some engineers to get the bridge between the Neon and Warren down. Even though it's not connected to Karma at all, this is one of the most genius choices in the game. It puts you right into Cole's shoes with how he feels about Zeke and Trish, the two most important people in his life. Zeke asks for something completely unnecessary but is friendly and wants Cole around. Trish asks for something important but is angry at Cole and wants as little to do with him as possible. Cole struggles with these two imperfect relationships. You choose which to do first, thus which is more important to you. There's no right or wrong answer. It's not connected to karma. Neither of Cole's friends are being that great to him right now. He has two unappealing options, and this choice does a fantastic job of making you feel that as a player. Some boys are trying too hard. I'm gonna talk about Zeke's mission first. Zeke wants a girlfriend like Cole had with Trish. He's jealous of Cole and is ignoring what's really important right now. He's focused on things that would matter in the normal world, but this is a crisis. Zeke claims that he loves this life, yet everything he's enjoying is a result of Cole's hard work. Having these powers isn't exactly a walk in the park. Are you crazy? People around here, they worship you, man. Cole puts up with him even though he knows he's wasting his time because Zeke is the only real friend he has right now. This mission has an odd karma choice. A poster artist stops you to ask which of the two posters he designed you like more. This is kinda a fun choice, but at the same time it's really dumb. What is the point of this being a choice? You're choosing how you want people to view you, but you're already doing that by simply following the karmic path you've chosen. Shouldn't the people just choose the posters to put up based off of your karmic state? Why does Cole have a say in this? Sucker Punch did add a nice detail to it though. If you choose the good poster, but do evil things, the good posters will be crossed out. Moving on to Trish's mission. You meet Roger, an engineer Trish and her sister Amy knew. Cole works with him to get the hydraulic bridge down so you have a way to cross between the Warren and Neon, and so Trish can take a bus of injured people to the hospital there. When Roger asks if Amy is safe, Cole lies to him and says she is. What about Amy? She make it out? Uh, yeah, she did. Good. Good. I hate to see both those girls stuck in here. He doesn't want Roger to think that he killed her too, and he really does feel guilty about her death, even though it wasn't his fault. Oh no, Roger! I'm so sorry! <laughs> From this point forward, most of the evil karma side missions involve Cole teaming up with Sasha, who communicates with him telepathically. Basically, Cole gets Reaper minions and mind-controlled people, causes chaos, and fights cops. It doesn't really make sense that the Reapers will still fight you outside of these missions, but this is a really good idea and one of the biggest changes Karma has to the story. It's also nice that this is completely optional, but if you're evil, Sasha will talk to Cole more during the story and basically become his love interest in place of Trish. My favorite part is that Sasha will cheer you on while fighting Kessler, which is completely absent when you're good. He's hurting. I wish the Sasha missions actually had some sort of ending, but oh well. Sucker Punch probably hadn't decided how or if they wanted to use Sasha in a sequel yet. The next power, and the last one for a while, is the Megawatt Hammer, aka Rockets. That's one of the better names for a power, it's almost as if Zeke named it. Out of all of the powers in the game, I think this is the least meaningful addition. You already have grenades, which are the same, except how they are aimed. There is a cool good karma upgrade where you can redirect the rockets to be more accurate, but other than that, they just don't feel unique like the other powers do. Damn it! The game crashed again!
you have another group of missions given to you that can be played in any order. Once again, this choice is effectively used to put you in Cole's shoes. He has a lot on his shoulders right now. He has to find John in the Ray Sphere to get out of the city, and there's a new lead. Zeke is building more and more of an ego and might be in danger. And on top of all this, the government might just blow up the whole city. Cole has the weight of the world on his shoulders, and the game dumps all of these tasks on you at the same time to make you feel the same way. Zeke didn't even get the girl after wasting Cole's time about it, and he's disappointed. This leads him to take reckless actions to feel important. He's been captured by the Dustmen after trying to spy on them alone. Zeke decided to try and be a hero himself, even though he's not strong enough. He's becoming more jealous of Cole and feels worthless. And he just made things worse by not thinking it through first. But just cause you got powers didn't make you better than everyone else. Not by a long shot. This level has a great location. It's in a shipyard the Dustmen have turned into a fortress. They use guerrilla warfare tactics against you with their tricks and traps that they have set up. The level is like a maze and you'll eventually end up on top of it. All around, this mission has great level design. Gold cage hostage to my feelings. Cole is getting more and more annoyed with Moya and how long this whole thing is taking. The Dustmen are getting smart and trying to get out by using boats full of hostages, but the government will do what they must to save the most lives. They are still a powerful force and a looming threat for Cole. The gameplay here feels like filler. It's a repetitive mission, and the enemy placement seems uninspired. I wish there was a timer counting down how much time you had to stop the boats or something to make it more intense. This is the worst mission in the game. The First Sons are using drones to search for the Ray Sphere, but one of the Dead Drops later explains that it was actually John controlling the drones that he hijacked from them. Cole has to shoot them down and search them for info. This mission is also repetitive and kinda boring. Kessler does call Cole and taunt him though. He has Sasha captive and he's hinting at his pasta. Oh! Typo. He's hinting at his past and what he's about to put you through. What separates the strong from the weak is the ability to take the beating. Hell, to love the beating. Driving the getaway car. Trish is ready to take her bus to the hospital. This is an escort mission that can be frustrating. If there is a weak point in the main story, it's definitely the first half of the Warren. The roof of the bus has been configured to give Cole unlimited energy, but the thing is you have to get off and on the bus to make it not bullshit. The bus moves too fast and there's too many rocket enemies to stay on top the whole time. The issue is players might not know they can get off the bus because the unlimited energy incentivizes them to stay on. The mission is really quite fun as long as you realize this. If not, it's really irritating. You should think about the consequence of your magnetic field being a little too strong. After escorting the bus, Alden shows up at the hospital and almost kills Trish. Cole rescues her and then Trish decides to either get back together with him or stay apart based on your karma. She either sees you're a good guy and forgives you, or has no regrets because she sees you're even worse than she thought. In both parts of this mission, slowing down and thinking of another way to get through your current situation helps a lot. The ending fight is extremely difficult if you don't flank the enemies. This sort of symbolizes how you need to think before you act to save a damaged relationship. And it's a nice subtle way to support the story through the gameplay. Afterwards, Sasha responds to what happened, which is a nice detail. I can't believe you, Cole. Back into her arms. She's not a lover. Not like me. This is the last time in the main story that you can choose what order to do missions in. There are two missions here, one where the cops arrest Alden, and one where the Dustmen have buses that go around and shoot everyone like crazy. This is sorta of an odd choice though, because the bus one seems to make more sense if it takes place after Alden's arrest instead of before. If you play it after Alden's arrest, Moya implies that the Dustmen's bus rampage was caused by it. Cops nabbed Alden, Moya. They're taking him to the pen. I heard. And so have the Dustmen. They're already rampaging through the streets of the war and shooting everyone in sight. Deal with them. But this line of dialogue isn't used if you play them the other way around. It's sort of cool how they mess with the chronological order of this based on what you choose, but it seems to me that there's no real reason for these missions to be played in any order you want other than to simply give the player more freedom. Anyways, the cops arrest Alden and Cole follows behind trying to catch up. A karma choice is introduced here that is really pointless. You either rescue this guy or leave him hanging. 
This same choice is repeated multiple times in free roam and it doesn't even activate in the first place unless you press triangle. So you can walk away from it many times without it counting as an evil choice. This mission could have been more intense if you were more involved in Alden's arrest instead of chasing behind, but it shows Cole's lack of power in this matter and that he can't control everything in his life. Alright, let's talk about that bus mission. This is a filler mission, but a good one. The gameplay is repetitive, but also a unique concept. You have to destroy buses that are murdering everyone with machine guns, but can only do it by sticking to rooftops and jumping on the buses from above, or you'll get shot. Great escape, the prison break. So Alden has been taken to the prison in the Warren, and now we have the story mission Alden in Chains. This is one of the best levels in the game. It's full of drama, chaotic fights, and tense pacing. Alden is being held in the prison, and his dustmen come to break him out. Cole, Zeke, and the cops have to defend the prison in a giant battle, and ultimately, Alden is freed because Zeke once again wanted to be a hero and didn't stand guard. The fights are overwhelming, especially the last one, even though you have unlimited energy. This makes you feel how Cole does. He tried his best and was let down by something, or someone, out of his control. Zeke's desire for importance and jealousy of Cole has now had a serious consequence. His irresponsibility leads to the deaths of many cops and a powerful criminal escaping. Zeke is Cole's best friend and the one person he trusted most. This is a wake-up call to Cole on how dangerous Zeke's immaturity can be. Cole feels lost and let down, set back on his goal, and feeling shaky about his best friendship. After this scene, the game cuts to Cole waking up for the first time not on Zeke's roof. Instead, he's at Trish's hospital. Moya calls and is angry at him for something that wasn't even his fault. Everything seems hopeless for Cole right now, and this is reflected extremely well in the gameplay. The last time you got a new power was 7 missions ago. Before this, the longest you had to wait was 2 missions. That's right, just 2. This time, it's 7. You've been starved of new powers to give you Cole's feeling of being lost, hopeless, and farther than ever from his goals. But something is about to go right for Cole, so you're given a new power. A shining beacon of hope in the form of the Polarity Wall. The Polarity Wall is an electric shield Cole can use to block bullets. It's obviously extremely useful. The shield doesn't use any energy, and you can move and drain while using it, but it's balanced because you can't attack while it's up. This power changes how combat can flow. Now Cole can move around enemies and flank them easier. More time is spent in the heat of the action, and the fights get even more intense with some more difficult enemies introduced shortly. The shield is most notably effective against miniguns, an enemy that gave you lots of trouble in the early game but now are easier to overcome. It also has some great upgrades. One makes it bigger, and size does matter here. The other converts damage absorbed by your shield into energy, which is amazingly useful and does even more to keep you in a fight instead of taking you out of one to drain. The shield is an amazing power that works as a piece of hope given to the player that is tactile to them. Why is it important for you to feel hope right now? Because John finally decides to contact Cole. Cole thought his objectives were farther away than ever, but it turns out they were very close. Sometimes things will keep going wrong even when you try your best, but also sometimes things go right and work out for no reason at all. It's just life. I made up my mind. I'm better off being alone. After a great chase sequence, Cole finally meets John. John is a very cynical agent who's gone AWOL. He infiltrated the First Sons, and after realizing the government wants the Ray Sphere for selfish purposes, he's been working alone to find and destroy the Sphere while hiding from the FBI and military. There's a subtle tension added to all his dialogue by him constantly stating how much time is left until his position can be triangulated. Find someone to help you retrieve it. Someone you can trust. One minute, 52 seconds. John is extremely focused on his goal and is wary to trust anyone. He tells Cole that Moya is not his wife and she's been lying to him. He blocks her calls and will only speak to Cole. So Cole stops working for Moya and instead follows John, the agent who is honest and translucent about his motives. There's another karma choice in this mission where you choose whether or not to shoot a gas tank to take down a golem easier, but also kill injured people who just so happen to be on the ground near it. This choice does effectively use gameplay to choose to be selfish or not, but it's really cheesy and at this point in the game, players have made up their minds on if they are good or evil, so it feels really pointless. And what the hell, the game won't even let me be evil here. There's nothing I hate more than what I can't have. 
John has used drones to discover the location of the Ray Sphere, on top of Alden's giant tower. I love that Alden has made a giant tower for himself out of garbage. It's useless and is only there so Alden can pretend to feel a sense of power that he doesn't have. He's compensating for his small penis. As far as I can tell, there are no combustibles in it, so it's not an explosive device. Maybe he's overcompensating for something actually for his lack of real power. He's gone completely mad, and it's actually hilarious, even though it's sad. John plans to steal the sphere from him, and asks Cole to bring along someone he trusts to help them. Cole doesn't trust Moya anymore, and certainly won't bring Trish into such danger, so he's left with Zeke, even though he doesn't really trust him too well after what just happened. You really get the feeling like something bad is about to happen. Cole doesn't trust Zeke or Moya, and John doesn't know if he can trust Cole yet. The end is so close in sight, but it feels a little too good to be true. This level is very fun and unique because it's vertical. You climb higher than before and get a great view of the city. There's a climactic fight on top of the tower. Cole holds off the Duskman while Zeke tries to get the sphere from Alden. Kessler shows up in a helicopter and Zeke gets the sphere free. Now he's presented with a choice of selfishness versus selflessness himself. Does he use the sphere to get the powers he desires, or does he give it over to Cole and John to destroy? This is why we can't have nice things. Zeke activates the Ray Sphere, but it doesn't work. Kessler tells him it's broken and it can be fixed if Zeke comes with him, which he does. The hope Cole felt with John showing up is demolished. His best friend has betrayed him out of jealousy. Everything Cole has been working towards was right there in Zeke's hands, and Zeke gave it away to a psychotic terrorist. And now John will trust Cole less. Cole is hurt more than ever before, and it's not the last time that will happen. Cole's care for Zeke and Zeke's jealousy of Cole drove them apart. It's fantastic character conflict and development. Also, something we might not remember or understand because of Infamous 2, is that in Infamous 1, the concept of what a conduit is, is not obvious to the player. You know that conduits are super-powered people, but it is only explained in a dead drop that only people with the conduit gene are able to get powers. Current testing shows that the sphere has no effect on humans that are not conduits. It is completely understandable for the player, and especially Zeke, to think that he would've got powers and be confused. Even if the sphere did work, Zeke wouldn't have got powers because he doesn't have the conduit gene. By the way, it's really confusing that Alden's tower falls down in the cutscene, but then it's still standing in the game. Alden is going on a rampage trying to get to Kessler and the Sphere. He's furious at Kessler and has completely lost any sanity he still had. Cole goes after Alden to stop him, which leads to a boss fight. Holy shit. Alden sits in a giant mechanical body on one platform and you're on another shooting at him. There's a lot of dodging and blocking involved, which keeps you moving. The best parts of the fight are where he shoots a ton of spiders at you that you have to deal with during his other attacks. You have to multitask, and it's really exciting. I can feel the flames on my skin. Cole defeats Alden, who says he wants to join Cole to defeat Kessler as a distraction, then jumps off the bridge and escapes. Alden is alive, but never seen or heard from again. This at first seems like a strange exit for the character, but after thinking about it, it totally makes sense. Alden could never overcome his pride. For his whole life, he believed that he had a rightful place in the world, and that was something he never obtained. What will likely happen to him after his escape is he continues the life of poverty Kessler put him in. He spent his whole life trying to get revenge and overcome what Kessler put him through, but ultimately, he never did because he couldn't let go of his selfish desire. In the end, he's a coward. He could have let go of his pride and worked with Cole to take down a common enemy, but instead he chose to run from the problem in defeat. It might have been cool to have a karma choice to spare or kill Alden, but I think letting Alden make his own choice made for a more powerful moment in the story. This brings a close to the second act where Cole's relationships changed and his trust has taken a beating. The game slowed down and let you really get to know the main characters as they developed, but now it's going to ramp up the pacing for a third act that brings the story to a close. Cole is going to face Kessler and find the answers he's been searching for all along. He feels betrayed and has suffered losses, but is focused and determined. Alright, next up we have Christian Gamer saying, also, dragon powers. Yes, dragon powers are definitely a good idea for a power in an infamous game. So let's take a look at the dragon power. This is what it looks like on good, your dragon's more, you know, green, blue, cool tones, and on evil, it's like red and orange tones, and like, 
It's a fire dragon on evil, and on good, it's an ice dragon. Anyways, you're wondering, where do I drain this power in a city? And I have the answer for you. You drain this power from dragons. So the melee for this power is dragon claws. You can use them to claw at enemies, like you're a dragon. And to move around with this power, what can you do? That's right, you can fly. That's right, for the first time in Infamous, except for Infamous Festival of Blood, actually. So for the second time in Infamous, you can now fly with dragon wings. And for your ranged attack, guess what? You can breathe fire. That's right. You can breathe fire out of your mouth and your nostrils. <sighs> I said I'm making a video now. Please call back at a later time. Well, actually, I have a power idea I wanted to share in your video. Oh, okay. Well, what is it? Don T. Care, but I know power do radio power for Plastic River Brick or more. Wait, how'd you get this number? This phone literally just randomly appeared on my desk. Hello? Hello? Ah! Ah!